Okay, we are recording. Hi there, everybody. I am doing this recorded lecture um, to go over chapter 10. And basically in chapter 10 and um, chapter 11, we're talking about um, plant assets or property plant equipment or, uh, you know, AKA fixed assets, right? And so in chapter 10, we're getting into, um, some of the issues with uh, plant assets, self-constructed assets, disposition, or uh, basically disposing of our assets, how to record a gain or loss, things like that. And then in chapter 11, we get into the main um, depreciation method. So we're talking about um, property plant equipment or plant assets or fixed assets, right? Those three terms are used interchangeably. So we're talking about those um, in chapter 10 and chapter 11. So we're going to go over um, chapter 10 in this recorded lecture and then obviously um, chapter 11 um, in the next. So um, I am going to share my screen with you and get the PowerPoint pulled up. Um, so again, uh, chapter 10, and let me get rid of this little box. I don't want to look at myself the whole time um, and start the slideshow. Okay, so chapter 10, again, we're looking at um, acquiring and or disposing of um, property, plan, and equipment. Uh, again, uh, PPE or property, plan, equipment, also known as plant assets or fixed assets. So um, we're going to talk about property plan equipment. And again, we're going to look at um, the accounting issues associated with self-constructed uh, assets with um, interest, capitalization, acquiring assets, uh, disposing of assets. Um, and so that's what we're looking at in chapter 10. And then again, 11, we continue on um, talking about plant assets, but in chapter 11, we learn uh, depreciation. So anyway, that's where we're going uh, with this. Okay, so property plan equipment, um, for us to categorize it as property plan equipment or plant assets or fixed assets, um, the assets have to be currently used in operations, not available for resale. Um, long term in nature, uh, long term in as much as they're going to last us multiple years or multi, you know, through multiple accounting periods. And then properly plant equipment have physical substance. They are tangible in nature, right? So tangible by definitions means that, right, it, we can touch it. It has physical substance, right? So um, being used currently in operations, um, will benefit more than one accounting period uh, has physical substance. So it's showing us some examples here, land, um, building structures, office, factories, warehouses, equipment, stuff like machinery, furniture, uh, tools, um, office equipment, right? Things like that. All right, so the acquisition of property plant equipment or acquiring uh, property plant equipment. Generally, property, plant, and equipment are um, based on or valued at historical cost. Um, you know, that historical cost concept or that cost principle says that we have to record assets at what we paid to acquire them. Um, so the historical cost in this case uh, measures the cash or cash equivalent price of obtaining the asset and bringing it to the location and condition necessary for its intended use. Um, the, you know, when, when thinking about this historical cost, what, Chloe? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> um, you know, when we think about this, uh, historical cost valuation, um, this is where we get into how we calculate the book value, right? Because we're always taking the historical cost of the asset less accumulated depreciation, and that's how we get the book value, right? So the cost of the asset, less accumulated depreciation equals that uh, book value. And we would continue to have that asset uh, on our books um, that way, unless we sold it, at which time, just like it shows here, we would record or recognize a gain or a loss when, when the asset is sold. 
Okay, so when we think about machinery and equipment, again, that acquisition cost, just like it said, acquisition cost is not only the purchase price of the asset, but any of those fees, one-time charges or fees to get it ready for us to use it, to get it ready for its intended use, right? So uh, when we think about machinery and equipment, not only the purchase price of the asset, but any one-time taxes that are paid on it, um, transportation charges to have it delivered, um, insurance uh, charges while it's in transit, um, any fees or charges associated, uh, associated with it being installed, assembled, or um, testing to get it ready for us to use. Again, any of these one-time fees um, associated with acquiring the asset and getting it ready for us to use we would include in the um, cost of the asset, right? Those, those costs would be capitalized um, in a sense because we're including them in the cost of the asset and then we'll depreciate it over time rather than um, expensing it in the period that it happens. All right, so buildings, again, not only the purchase price or the price of construction on the building, but any title fees, attorney fees, uh, taxes, um, brokerage fees, uh, you know, sales commission fees, whatever the case might be, any of those one-time fees to get it ready for us to use would be included in the acquisition cost of the building. This is going to come into play um, as we continue through the PowerPoints, because we're going to see, especially when we're constructing a new asset like a building, um, we're going to end up including um, like interest capitalization and some different things like that in the uh, cost of the building. All right, and then land, you know, again, not only the purchase price of land, but any of those one time uh, fees or those one time costs to get it ready for us to use. So title insurance premium, property taxes, um, surveying fees, title search and transfer fees, real estate commission. Also like your book mentions, um, if, we, if there's an old building on the land, we have to tear down the old building to get the land ready for us to use, that would be included in the, the cost of the land. With land, however, uh, land is not a depreciable asset. We do not depreciate land. And kind of the, and we'll learn about this more in, in the next chapter, in chapter 11, but kind of the, um, the idea or the underlying concept behind this is the fact that we depreciate assets that have an estimated useful life, right? Like for example, we might say equipment will last five years, right? So we depreciate those assets that we can reasonably estimate their useful life. But with land, land, the useful life cannot be reasonably estimated because presumably the land is gonna be here even after we're gone, right? So um, for that reason, land is not um, depreciated. All right, so acquiring uh, property plant equipment, again, uh, one of these uh, examples that your book talks about, um, self-constructed assets or basically assets in, uh, you know, that we are paying, for example, a construction company to, um, if, if we're paying a construction company to build a building for us, for example, right? These self-constructed assets, how we determine the acquisition cost um, would include materials and labor associated with the construction. Now those things are um, easily traceable. Uh, generally speaking, we know from receipts and orders and things how much we spend on materials. Uh, we know how much man hours or, or labor, I shouldn't say man hours, <laughs> that's not politically correct. <laughs> uh, how, how many individual direct labor hours that were um, charged to the job. So those things are a little bit easier to calculate. Um, overhead, though, on the other hand, as we have learned um, in uh, other aspects with cost and managerial accounting, namely, um, overhead is a little bit harder to apply. Um, so there's a couple ways that your book talks about dealing with it. Um, basically, 
uh, fixed overhead because fixed overhead would be the same no matter if we were constructing a new asset or not. Um, the first way is to assign no fixed overhead uh, to the cost of construction. And then the second way is to assign a portion or all overhead um, to the construction process. And just like it shows here, the second uh, method is what is used most often by companies. And so uh, recording interest costs during construction, again, we're gonna get practice with um, some of these calculations and they're not too bad, um, I think once we start doing them, but um, basically GAAP requires capitalizing uh, actual interest with a uh, modification based on what could have been avoidable if we were not constructing the asset. So the amount to capitalize when we look at this we're going to look at um, avoidable interest versus actual interest right because actual interest could include any loans or liabilities that we have outstanding avoidable interest again would be the interest that we could avoid if we were not constructing the asset um, and so that's what we end up using the lesser of the two the lesser of actual versus um, of avoidable interest but um, you know fit, uh, a couple of few things that we have to keep in mind um, in the capitalization process what are the qualifying assets what is the capitalization period? What is the amount to capitalize? And again, we're gonna look at examples in the PowerPoints of each of these. Um, and then we'll also get practice with this in class together. But um, qualifying assets, just like it shows here, require a period of time to get them ready for their intended use. Again, in the example of a building construction, maybe it's gonna take 18 months to construct the building, right? So, um, you know, we have to keep that time period in mind. And then the two types of assets that are considered qualifying assets, assets under construction for a company's own use or assets intended for sale or lease that are constructed or produced as discrete um, projects. So um, constructed or produced to sell uh, basically is what that's saying, right? And then the capitalization period, again, we have to calculate actual interest um, versus avoidable interest. And the way that we have to do that is by looking at um, our, our first expenditure for the project and basically, you know, what portion of the year we would use to capitalize interest on that. And then we look at that for each. So, you know, for example, if we make our first payment in um, July, right? the money wouldn't have been incurring interest charges the entire year, only half of the year, right? So we have a capitalization period um, for each expenditure basically, right? So that's what it's showing us here. So the capital period begins when expenditures for the asset have been made. Activity for readying, activities for readying the asset are in progress and interest costs are being incurred. And again, the period ends when the asset is substantially, uh, su substantially complete and ready for use. All right, so here's our example of that. It says, assume a company borrowed 200,000 at 12% interest from State Bank on January 1, 2017, for specific purposes of constructing special purpose equipment to be used in its operations. Construction on the equipment began on January 1, 2017, and the following expenditures were made prior to the project's completion on December 31st, 2017. So in this example, this is a year long project, right? It's starting on January 1, the project's gonna be complete December 31, right? So actual expenditures during 2017. And using this example, the next few slides are gonna walk us through the steps uh, of this process, but just to kind of give you a little highlight of what we're gonna do. So January 1, this $100,000 we spent January 1. Again, these would this $100 because it was uh, spent on January 1 would have been incurring interest expenses the entire year. So then we're gonna apply interest costs for the entire year to that. 
uh, this expenditure made on April 30th, 150,000. This would only be incurring interest expenses or interest charges for um, eight months, I think, right? May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, right? So eight months. So then we're only gonna charge, you know, basically interest to this um, expenditure um, for eight of 12 months, right? Uh, the November 1st expenditure of 300,000, again, that would have only incurred interest for two months, November, December. Um, so two out of 12 would be the fraction that we use on that. And then the December 31st expenditure, that's at the very end of the year. So zero interest is going to be charged or capitalized based on that last expenditure. So we've got total expenditures of 650,000. And then it's telling us here other general debt existing on January 1, 2017. We had 500,000 worth of bonds payable liability. Um, that incurs 14% uh, interest, 10-year uh, bonds. And then we had a $300,000 note payable, uh, which incurs 10% interest um, over five years. So you know, I mentioned this uh, a couple slides ago. The reason that they're giving us these other general debt um, obligations is because when we calculate actual interest versus avoidable interest, um, actual interest is the interest, all of the interest that we've incurred, not just on um, debt or liability related to the construction of the asset, right? But on all of our debt uh, would be our actual interest charges, where, like I said, avoidable interest is the interest we would have avoided if not constructing the asset. And we are required uh, by GAAP to capitalize the lesser of the two. So the lesser of actual versus um, avoidable. And so again, we're going to see that in this example as we continue um, through the PowerPoint. So step one, determine which assets qualify for capitalization of interest. Special purpose equipment qualifies because it requires a period of time to get ready and will be used in the company's operations. Um, step two, determine the capitalization period. Again, the capitalization period is the period of the project. Um, in this case, it spans the entire accounting year or the entire um, calendar year from January 1 to December 31. And then compute the weighted average accumulated expenditures. Again, this is what, you know, what I was saying with the expenditures. It depends on at what point throughout the year that we um, paid it or uh, paid the expenditure because that is dependent on how much interest is going to get charged to it, right? So um, we see here, oh, hot dog. So we see here uh, January 1, 100,000. Again, that's going to be subject to 12 out of 12 months of interest, right? Uh, April 30th, we paid 150,000. Well, this was at the end of April. So we're not going to incur interest charges from April. So then we would say, you know, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. So eight out of 12 months. Um, November 30th, this 300,000, again, because that's paid on November 1, um, we're going to charge interest or incur interest November, December. Um, December 31, since this is paid the very last day of the year, again, this is not going to be, um, there's not going to be any interest capitalized on this last one, right? So um, even though we have had actual expenditures of 650000 the weighted average accumulated expenditures that we use for interest capitalization purposes is only 250,000, right? Uh, going by at what dates they were paid throughout the period, throughout the year. All right, and then step four, compute the actual and avoidable interest. So um, uh, again, for actual interest, um, you know, that's simple. We know, you know, for example, this uh, bonds payable, we pay bonds holders 14% interest. Our notes payable, we pay 10% interest on the note. If we took out a loan for the construction of the asset, we know, you know, X amount interest on the loan. So um, uh, again, actual interest, the actual interest that we have on all of our, um, on all of our debt or all of our loans, right? Um, 
But the avoidable interest, again, um, the avoidable interest, what we could have avoided if not construction, constructing the asset, right? So selecting appropriate interest rates. So for the portion of weighted average accumulated expenditures that is less than or equal to any amounts borrowed specifically to finance construction of the assets, use the interest rate incurred on the specific borrowings. For the portion of the weighted average accumulated expenditures that is greater than any debt incurred specifically to finance the construction of the asset, we use the weighted average of interest rates incurred on all the outstanding debt during the period. All right, so here's our example of that. So if we have um, specific debt on, on the construction of this asset of 200,000, um, we're paying 12% interest rate. That's actual interest of 24,000 um, on that specific debt, right? But then on this other debt, 500,000 times 14%, that's 70,000 interest. Um, 300,000 times 10%, that is 30,000 of interest, right? So we've got um, total debt, um, 1 million. Interest, 124,000. Again, to get the weighted average interest rate on general debt. We're taking the numerator there, the actual interest of our general debt, right, as our numerator. Um, and then we're dividing that by um, the, the total debt of that general debt, 800,000, right? So we've got a, a weighted average interest rate for our general debt of 12 and a half percent. So then when we're calculating um, actual versus avoidable interest, if we look at uh, accumulated expenditures, again, we took out a specific loan to cover or to help us cover the, the cost of construction of 200,000 that has a 12% interest rate, that's 24,000. And then the amount by which weighted average accumulated expenditures exceeds the construction loan um, 50,000, we're going to base that interest on that weighted average interest rate on the general debt. So, you know, again, if we were not construction, uh, constructing this asset, we would be able to avoid um, $30,250 of interest, basically, right, is, is what this is showing us. So, if we're looking at the difference between actual $124,000 and avoidable 30,250. You know, again, GAAP requires that we choose to capitalize the lesser of the two. So then we're going to capitalize this avoidable interest, this 30,250. So that's what it's showing us here in step five, capitalize the lesser of avoidable interest or actual interest. Um, in, in this case, avoidable interest, of course, is the lesser of the two, 30,250. And so um, to capitalize this interest, we're going to debit equipment. And so that's increasing the acquisition cost of the equ equipment. So we're gonna debit equipment credit interest expense. And, and so basically, um, you know, if we if we think about how we would normally record interest expense, right? We would normally record interest expense with a debit to the expense, a credit to cash, for example, or a debit to interest expense, credit to interest payable, right? Maybe, um, but but normally um, when we are recording the expense, we're debiting the expense, right? Debiting interest expense. In this case, we're essentially moving it out of this actual interest category, right? Um, because normally we would um, debit interest expense for the 124,000, right? But what we're doing is we're moving that portion, 30,250, out of interest expense account into the equipment cost account. Because again, we're going to capitalize that interest. We're going to include it in the um, acquisition cost of the asset, the cost to acquire the asset. We're going to depreciate it over time, right? We're going to capitalize it. All right. So here's another example. It says on November 1, 2016, Shala Company contract, uh, contracted Pfeiffer Construction Company to construct a building for uh, 1400000 on land costing 100000 purchased from the contractor and included in the first payment. 
Shala made the following payments to the construction company during 2017. So January 1, we paid 210,000. Again, that first payment included uh, the thousand dollars, or excuse me, the hundred thousand um, to purchase the land as well. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, January 1, 210,000, March 1, 300,000, May 1, 540, December 31st, 450 for a total of 1.5 million. Again, the cost to construct the billion uh, building, <laughs> 1.4 million, and then the land, 100,000, so 1.5 altogether. Um, and so we're going to see with this again, um, this January 1, a portion of this is going to be subject to... Um, interest capitalization, right? March 1, a portion of this subject in interest capitalization, May 1, so on and so forth, like we saw in our previous uh, example. And then uh, some other information they're giving us here, specific construction debt. So we took out a 15% three-year note to finance purchase of land and construction of the building dated December 31, 2016, with interest payable annually on December 31st. So we took out basically a $750,000 loan, uh, a long-term note payable in this case, a three-year note, right? So we took out a, a $750,000 um, loan that has 15% interest. And then other debt that we had outstanding, we had a 10% five-year note payable dated December 31st, 2013, with interest payable annually on December 31st. And then we had a 12% 10-year bond issued December 31st, 2012, with interest payable annually on December 31st. So it's asking us first to compute the weighted average accumulated expenditures for 2017. Um, oh dear, it looks like maybe, maybe this slide got deleted accidentally. Oh, let me go grab my book and tell you what page this is on, hot dog. Okay, so let's see. I don't know. I thought that I had a slide in here showing it, but now it's pulled up and I'm like, darn it, where did it go? Um, let's see here. Do to do, do voluntary conversion. Oh man, hot dog. Oh, I apologize, guys. Um, trying to see where it shows us this in the book because apparently I did not. Um, so it shows us this actually on page 510. Um, and so basically the 210,000 um, that we spent in January, um, that would be subject to 12 out of 12 months uh, for interest capitalization purposes, right? Um, the March 1, uh, 300,000 um, would be subject to 10 out of 12 months, right? Because we paid it in uh, March 1st. So March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, right? 10 months. Um, the May 1 um, expenditure, 540,000 would be subject to eight out of 12 months uh, interest capitalization. Um, so, you know, we paid it May 1st, so May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, right? So eight, um, eight months. The December 31st expenditure, obviously uh, zero out of 12 months uh, interest capitalization purposes, right? So even though our expenditures total um, 1.5 million, when we look at um, the weighted average of these accumulated expenditures, we only have weighted average of accumulated expenditures of 820,000. And so um, we took out a loan for 750, but we have weighted average accumulated expenditures of 820. And so what's gonna end up happening is we're gonna have that, you know, the 750, we're gonna apply interest based on the 15%, right? But the um, other $70,000 is going to be, we're going to apply interest based on a weighted average interest rate we're going to calculate for here. 
Okay, so this shows us our, um, and it's so weird. I don't know if it just got out of order. Yeah, it's very strange because I, I feel like I had another slide that went in here, but um, now it's not such a great example. Um, it shows us how we calculate this, and I swore that I had a slide for this, so it's very strange, but it shows us how this is done on page 511. Again, the um, 750,000, so when we're uh, calculating avoidable interest, right, the 750,000, we would uh, multiply by the 15% interest. And so that would tell us the interest on that is 112,500. The other 70,000, again, because the weighted average ex um, accumulated expenditures was 820, the specific debt was 750. So the other, the $70,000 difference, um, we're gonna apply the, the weighted average um, interest rate of 11.04% of to this. So. Um, if, if we calculated actual interest, it'd be, you know, 239,500. Um, but the avoidable interest was 120,228. So again, we're going to choose the lesser of the two. And that's what it's showing us here, this next slide. It's showing us this at the, at the bottom of page 511. Um, so for each expenditure, the date of each expenditure, how we would record that. So January 1st, when we spent the 210,000, um, part of that went to land, part of that went to buildings, or uh, they're putting, you know, CIP in, in parentheses here, construction and process, uh, basically is what that stands for. And then crediting cash. Uh, March 1, uh, debiting buildings, crediting cash. May 1, debiting buildings, crediting cash. December 31, debiting uh, buildings for this last uh, $450,000 uh, expenditure, crediting cash. But then we also have to debit buildings for the amount of interest that we're gonna capitalize. So again, the total amount of interest, 239,500, but the avoidable interest, the part that we're going to capitalize 120,228. So we're, instead of debiting interest expense for the entire 239,500, we're debiting buildings for the amount of avoidable interest. We're debiting interest expense for the difference between actual and avoidable and then crediting um, cash. Anyway, we'll get some practice with those entries together. And that's just kind of showing you this here. You know, again, normally, um, we would be debiting interest expense for the entire 239,500, right? But because we're capitalizing some of this, we're including this in the cost of the asset, the acquisition cost of the asset. Then we subtract the portion that we're capitalizing. And so this is what is actually gonna be charged to interest expense, 119,272, right? All right. All right, so, uh, when we think about um, disposing of an asset or acquiring an asset, um, you know, we have to think about what the asset's worth, the fair value of the asset, or, or a lot of times what we use is the book value of the asset. So um, companies should record property plan equipment at the fair value of what they give up or at the fair value of the asset received, whichever is more clearly evident. Again, as we're gonna see as we go through these examples and we get practice with this in class, generally speaking, we're looking at the original cost of the asset, less accumulated depreciation and that book value um, of the asset. So um, cash discount, you know, a couple things that we have to keep in mind when valuing assets, um, cash discounts uh, for prompt payment, um, uh, again, usually with uh, a cash discount, um, we would reduce the cost of the asset. Um, and so we saw this with um, inventory, for example. If we, get an, if we get a discount on inventory, the purchase of inventory, then that reduces the price of the inventory, right? And that's, so it's, that's the same thing when we're talking about property, plant, and equipment. If we get some kind of discount um, for, for paying promptly or, or something like that, that reduces the cost of the asset, right? Um, 
deferred payment contracts, assets purchased on long-term credit contracts at the present value of the consideration exchanged. So on this example, and they talk about this like around page 513, 514 of our textbook, we're gonna end up looking at the present value. Um, so we'll use those present value tables, uh, refer back to them uh, from chapter six. Lump sum purchases allocate the total cost among the various assets on the basis of their relative fair market values. We actually looked at some of these lump sum calculations in, um, in chapter nine as well as it related to, um, um, you know, for, for example, when we purchase several different assets in one lump sum group, um, we have to look at, you know, basically the proportion of each asset to the value overall of our, of all the assets, if that makes sense. So um, anyway, we're going to get some practice with that, look at examples of that. Um, and then the issuance of stock, um, the market price of the stock issued is a fair indication of the cost of the property acquired. And as we're going to see, a lot of times there is a difference or, you know, many times there's a difference in the par value of the stock or and then the market price of the stock. And so when we have that difference, um, we look at an account called um, paid in capital excess of par. Um, so, you know, we'll see examples of those. Uh, exchanges of non-monetary assets. Again, uh, these are ordinarily accounted for on the basis of uh, the fair value of the asset given up, the fair value of the asset received, whichever is clearly more evident. And companies should recognize immediately any gains or losses on the exchange when the transaction has commercial substance. And so it talks about this more um, the top of page 517, illustration 10-10, kind of has a good um, representation of this. So when the exchange has commercial substance, uh, we would recognize gains and losses immediately. When the exchange lacks commercial substance, um, no cash is received, we defer the gains, uh, recognize losses immediately. And when the exchange lacks commercial substance and cash is received, we would recognize partial gain, recognize losses immediately. So um, commercial substance in a, in a sense, it just means that um, the future cash flows change as a result of the transaction. So if we think about you know, two, two parties, um, and, and they, and then if they make a commercially substance, uh, or, or commercial substance exchange rather, um, then it, it changes the financial position of, of both of those, of both of those companies or both of those people or organizations, right? So, um, commercial substance. Um, and, and that's just what it's showing here. Exchange has commercial substance if the future value or the future cash flows exchange, uh, future cash flows change as a result of the transaction. That is, if the two parties' economic positions change, the transaction has um, commercial substance. And this is what I was saying at the top of page 517. Um, if it has commercial substance, we're going to recognize gains or losses immediately. If the exchange lacks commercial substance, no cash is exchanged, we can defer the gains, recognize losses immediately. Um, if the exchange lacks commercial substance, uh, cash is received, we recognize a partial gain um, depending on the portion of cash received or recognize losses immediately. And just like it shows here, if cash is 25% or more of the fair value of the exchange, we recognize the entire gain because the earnings process would be complete, right? Ha has commercial substance, we have to recognize um, the, the entire gain. All right, so exchanges when there is a loss situation, again, companies recognize a loss immediately whether the exchange has commercial substance or not. And just like it shows here, um, companies should not value assets at more than their cash equivalent price. 
if the loss were deferred, assets would be overstated. So if we tried to spread the loss out over a period of time, for example, um, then we would be overstating our assets, right? We wouldn't want to do that. All right, so here's an example of this. It says Information Processing Inc. trades its used machine for a new model at Jared Business Solutions Inc. The exchange has commercial substance. The used machine has a book value of 8,000. And again, that book value is calculating by uh, calculated by taking the original cost 12,000 less 4,000 accumulated depreciation. And it has a fair value of 6,000. The new model list for 16,000. Jared Business Solutions gives information processing a trade in allowance of 9,000 for the used machine. Um, information processing computes the cost of the new asset as follows. So we've got the list price of the new machine, 16,000, less the trade in that they gave us for the used machine, right? They gave us 9,000 for the used machine. So then we only owed 7,000 on this asset. The fair value of the new machine, or excuse me, fair value of the used machine was 6,000. So then the cash payment due plus the fair value of what we traded in is the cost of the new machine, 13,000, right? So when we record this, we would be, you know, debiting equipment, this machine for 13,000, right? And I think we see that here, right? So here's how we would record um, that asset. So information processing records this transaction as follows. So we debit equipment 13,000. We're debiting or zeroing out the accumulated depreciation for the old equipment, 4,000. Um, we're also uh, crediting or zeroing out the old equipment, uh, original cost of the old equipment, 12,000. We're crediting cash for seven. The difference between our debits and credits, again, is that loss on the disposal of, of the equipment. And so if it's a loss, it gets debited, right? Because it essentially decreases um, revenue, it's, it's just like an expense, right? Um, so if it's a loss, it gets debited, a gain gets credited. Uh, a gain is, is just like an increase in revenue, right? It's credited. Um, and so uh, another way that we could look at this um, is if we take the fair value of the used machine, 6,000, less the book value of the used machine, we had a, a $2,000 loss on the disposal of that used machine. All right, so, oh, hot dog. Exchanges in a gain situation. So when it has um, commercial substance, company usually records the cost of a non-monetary asset acquired in exchange for another non-monetary asset at the fair value of the asset given up and immediately recognizes a gain. So here's our example of that. Interstate Transportation Company exchanged a number of used trucks plus cash for a semi-truck. The, the used trucks have a combined book value of 42,000. Again, we got that book value by taking 64,000 original cost of the trucks less the 22,000 accumulated depreciation on the trucks. So that's that book value of 42. Interstate's purchasing agent experienced in the secondhand market indicates that the used trucks have a fair market value of 49,000. In addition to the trucks, Interstate must pay 11,000 cash for the semi-truck. Interstate computes the cost of the semi-truck as followed. So fair value of trucks exchanged, 49,000. And then the cash paid 11,000. So we're gonna have a cost on this semi-truck of 60,000. Again, to record this transaction, we would debit the semi-truck for 60,000. We also want to debit accumulated depreciation from the old trucks because we want to zero out that accumulated depreciation from the old trucks since we're getting rid of them. Um, we want to also credit trucks, the used trucks, um, the original cost of those used trucks. We want to zero that out since we're disposing of it. Um, and then also we're paying cash in this case of 11,000. And again, the difference between the debits and the credits is that gain on the disposal of, of trucks. And so um, to see this presented another way, if we take you know, the, the fair value of the used trucks, 49,000, 
less basically the book value of the used trucks, 42,000. We've got a gain on this disposal of 7,000, right? All right, exchanges in a, a gain situation that lacks commercial substance, no cash received. It says now assume interstate transportation company exchange lacks commercial substance. Interstate defers the gain of 7,000 and reduces the basis of the semi truck. So in this case, instead of recording the semi truck at 60,000, like we did in the previous example, we're going to reduce the cost of the semi truck asset. We're going to record it at 53,000 instead. Um, and so that's what it's showing us here is that um, Interstate records the exchange transaction as follows. We're going to debit semi truck 53,000. We still have to zero out accumulated depreciation on the old trucks. We still have to zero out um, the old trucks that we that we traded. Um, we still have that credit to cash for eleven thousand. Again, that that difference is um, reducing the book value or reducing the cost of the semi trucks, right? So, fair value of semi truck sixty thousand less that deferred gain uh, basis would be fifty three thousand. The other way to look at it, book value of used trucks, 42,000 plus the cash paid 11,000. So then we could say basis of the semi truck, 53,000. All right, in the example of um, when the, and this is kind of that third, uh, when the exchange lacks commercial substance um, and, and some cash is received, it says when the company receive, receives cash, sometimes referred to as a boot, in an exchange that lacks commercial substance, it may immediately recognize a portion of the gain. The general formula for gain recognition when an exchange includes some cash is as follows. So whatever cash is being received, that's what we use as our numerator. Um, divided by cash received plus the fair value of other assets received is what we use as the denominator um, times the total gain is the portion that we recognize. And the next slide shows us an example of this. So it says, Queenan Corporation traded in used machinery with a book value of 60,000. And that's the cost 110,000 less accumulated depreciation of 50 and a fair value of 100,000. It receives in exchange a machine with a fair value of 90,000 plus cash of 10,000. So fair value of machine exchanged 100,000 less, the book value of machine exchanged 60,000. So we're gonna have a gain on this asset of 40,000. But again, what portion of this do we have to um, recognize? And so it's showing us here with the numbers plugged in. The portion of the gain a company recognizes is the ratio of the monetary assets, the cash in this case, to the total consideration received. So again, in the numerator, we're taking that, that cash boot, that 10,000 we're receiving. And as the denominator, we're taking the denominator as the cash boot um, plus the um, other considerations received, right? That 90,000 um, times the 40,000. So we're going to recognize 4,000 uh, gain on this example. And so to record this, just like it's showing us, ooh, hot dog, just like it's showing us here, we would um, debit cash for 10,000. Uh, debit the new machine for 54,000, debit accumulated depreciation. Again, this is on the old machinery to zero out accumulated depreciation. Um, credit the old machine, 110,000 to zero that out since we've traded it in and then credit gain on the disposal of machinery. All right, anyway, we'll get some practice with these entries and these calculations together um, in class. All right, so here's another example. It says Santana Company exchanged equipment used in its manufacturing operations plus 2,000 in cash for similar equipment used in the operations of Delaware Company. 
The following information pertains to the exchange. So Santana, the equipment had a cost of 28,000 accumulated depreciation of 19. So the book value 28,000 minus 19,000. At that point, the book value would be 9,000, right? Um, fair value of the equipment, 13,500 cash given up 2,000. Uh, Delaware company, uh, 28,000 accumulated depreciation 10, which means it would have a book value of 18,000. Um, fair value, 15,500. So um, in, in this case, okay, so Delaware's equipment had a cost of uh, 28, accumulated depreciation of 10, uh, which would make the book value 18, and fair value 15. So then we're going to have a loss on for Delaware, right? Um, Santana, the book value was 9, fair value 13. So we're going to have a gain on um, this one. And, and so we'll see that in these journal entries. Um, maybe. <laughs> maybe I'm lying. My goodness. Okay. I don't know what happened to my PowerPoint. I feel like things got accidentally deleted here. But um, this example, let me see if I can find it um, in the book um, real quick here for Santana. Um, no, and I don't, I don't have it here. But anyway, we'll we'll get some practice um, with those types of um, entries together in class. I can't find the the page number off the top of my head. All right, so accounting for contributions. This is like the you know one of the last things kind of touched on um, in this chapter. Um, when we think about donations or contributions and, and how do we record these uh, types of transactions. So we use the fair value of the asset to establish its value on the books um, or on our balance sheet. And then we should recognize contributions received as revenues in the period received. So if we are on the receiving end of the contribution, it's contribution revenue, right? If we are paying a contribution, then it's contribution expense, obviously, right? All right, so here's our example of that. Um, oops, hot dog. It says, Max Weyer Meatpacking Inc. Has, recent, has recently accepted a donation of land with a fair value of 150,000 from the Memphis Industrial Development Corporation. In return, Max Ware, Ware Meat Packing promises to build a packing plant in Memphis. Max Ware's entry is debit to land, 150,000, credit to contribution revenue. Um, when a company contributes a non-monetary asset, it should record the amount of the donation as an expense at the fair value of the donated asset. Here's our example of that. It says Klein Industries donates land to the city of Los Angeles for a city park. The land cost uh, 80,000 and has a fair value of 110,000. Klein Industries records this donations as follows. So debit to the contribution expense, a credit to land for the original cost of the land, right? Because we're donating this land, we'd be zeroing out uh, the land asset on our, on our books, right? So we um, credit land for the original cost of the land and then credit gain on the disposal of the land. All right, cost subsequent to acquisition. Um, in, in general, cost incurred to achieve greater future benefits should be capitalized. So um, whether it's extending, you know, the life of the asset in years or it's extending the life of the assets in the more that we can produce, whatever the case may be, um, if it is at the betterment or in, you know, um, to better the asset, uh, generally those costs should be capitalized, right? Whereas expenditures that simply maintain a given level of services should be expensed. In order to capitalize cost, one of three conditions must be present. So useful life must be increased, uh, quantity or, uh, excuse me, quantity of units produced must be increased or quality of units produced must be enhanced, right? So um, 
uh, extraordinary um, type expenditures, again, that extend the useful life or extend the production capacity um, of an asset. So some of these major types of extraordinary uh, expenditures, additions, increase or extend uh, existing assets. Improvements and replacements are substitutions of an improved asset or an existing one. Uh, rearrangement and reinstallation, movement of assets from one location to another, repairs, expenditures that maintain assets in, in their, their current condition for operation. And so disposition or disposing of property, plant, and equipment. Um, and, and we looked at some examples of, all of this already uh, throughout the, the PowerPoint slides, but a company may retire plant assets voluntarily or dispose of them by sale, exchange. Um, in, involuntary conversion is like, you know, if we have to involuntarily uh, get rid of the asset, so it was damaged maybe because of fire um, or, theft or, you know, some other type of uh, like disaster <laughs> type thing um, or abandonment. So depreciation must be taken up to the date of disposition. So if we dispose it in the middle of the year, we have to depreciate the asset through the middle of the year basically is, is what it's showing here. And so on this hot dog, I always get clicker happy on here. So um, on this example, it says Barrett Company recorded depreciation on a machine costing 18,000 for nine years at the rate of 1200 per year. If it sells the machine in the middle of the 10th year for 7,000, Barrett records depreciation to the date of the sale. So if we're depreciating 1200 bucks per year, and now we sell it in the middle of the year, we have to record the uh, depreciation expense up to that point. So debiting depreciation expense, crediting accumulated depreciation, right? And so um, we, so the original machine cost 18,000 um, and we are depreciating it uh, for nine years at a rate of 1200 per year. We sell the machine in the middle of the 10th year for 7,000, okay? And then now if we, or when we sell this equipment rather, it says Barrett Company recorded depreciation on the machine costing 18,000 for nine years at a rate of 1,200 per year. If it sells the machine in the middle of the 10th year for 7,000, Barrett records depreciation to the date of the sale. And then this entry, again, and we saw that on the previous slide, this entry is the entry to record the sale of the asset. So um, we're selling it for 7,000 cash. So we're debiting cash for 7,000. We have to clear out the accumulated depreciation account associated with this asset. So we're debiting accumulated depreciation. We have to clear out or credit the actual asset account that we're getting rid of, machinery asset for 18000 The difference here between the debits and credits is the gain on the disposal of machinery, 400 All right, involuntary conversion. Uh, again, involuntary conversion, we all probably know what involuntary means at this point. So um, this is usually, you know, not wasn't by choice, but we had to get rid of the asset. And just like it shows here, fire, flood, theft, or condemnation, um, companies report the difference between the amount recovered, uh, whether it's from an insurance um, payout or something like that, if any, and then the assets book value as either a gain or a loss on the asset, right? So here's our example of that. This one says Camel Transport Corporation had to sell a plant located on company property that stood directly in the path of an interstate highway. For a number of years, the state had sought to purchase the land on which the plant stood, but the company resisted. The state ultimately exercised its right of eminent domain, which the courts upheld. In settlement, Camel received 500,000, which substantially exceeded the 200,000 book value of the plant and land, which had a cost of 400,000 less accumulated depreciation of 200,000. 
So then when we dispose of this, even though it's through involuntary conversion, we still got to record it like any other disposal, right? So the amount of cash being brought in, we're debiting cash, 500,000. We have to debit accumulated depreciation to zero out the accumulated depreciation on the asset that has now been disposed of, right? We have to also credit plant assets, again, to zero out that asset that has just been disposed of. And the difference between the debits and credits, in, in this case, the 500,000 received and the 200,000 uh, book value, we've got a gain on the disposal of the assets of 300,000. All right, so we're gonna get practice with these calculations together. These are some of the exercises um, and or brief exercises that I have picked out to look at. This is pretty, um, uh, ambitious uh, schedule of, of exercises to cover. So we'll see how many that we get through together. Um, as always, once you're able to view, hi guys, <laughs> once you're able to view this recorded lecture, um, if you have any questions, let me know. And I look forward to going over these things in class together with you. Bye guys, see you later.